Uh, Nick started the day by complaining about the rain here. So I'm going to one-up him and tell you that when I looked at the news from my home country, Finland, this morning, it turned out that we had first snow in northern Finland today. <laughs> so um, it makes the rain feel much better, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, so um, shortly into the subject that we are talking about to today. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, increased automation, uh, autonomy and remote operations. And I think it was wonderful to see that presentation that we had earlier on, where there was talk, talk about science fiction versus science fact. And the, the first picture here, this is from what actually I've heard people refer to as science fiction movies back in the 2000. 16, I think it was when um, Rolls-Royce introduced the concept of, let's say, maritime autonomous commercial vessels. But what I will try to talk about today is a little bit more about the science facts. And I'll try to give a brief glimpse into what has happened. Uh, 1C is a company alliance, which uh, I am running and this, these are the companies in the alliance at the moment. Um, some of the examples that I'm going to be talking about, some of the pictures you can see here, are from our alliance members, some are from other uh, partners around the world. But um, anyway, none of it is science fiction, but all science fact. So. Um, Early on, uh, there were a lot of demonstrations around, and, and this is one of those. This is actually a remote-operated ferry uh, right outside the capital of Finland, Helsinki, uh, operated by ABB in this uh, particular instance. This was when Rolls-Royce um, introduced, they had a Svan project where they first uh, showed a road ferry being autonomously operated between two islands in the Finnish archipelago. Then we're jumping off to Norway. We're going to hear from um, some uh, presenters from there today as well. Uh, this is the Fölgefon uh, in uh, a fjord in Norway, where Wärtsil demonstrated uh, dock-to-dock -dock, uh, auto-docking capacity. Um, this is from Japan, uh, actually, where NYK lines were the first to, to um, look at the IMO intermediate guidelines for mass testing, which have come out a few years ago already. So we are kind of on the way. Yara Birkeland uh, in Norway again, uh, by Kongsberg. Uh, well, Kongsberg is one of the suppliers on the vessel. Uh, and Masterly is, is running it. This is a vessel uh, which is fully electric and planning to go autonomous at some point. Uh, now, when we look at autonomous, uh, I think it was also very suitable that we earlier had a session where we talked a lot about port digitalization. Uh, in order to get the full benefits of increasing automation, it cannot be done on ships alone, but it has to be done on harbors. This is from Kalmar, or the picture was from Kalmar. This is from an inland sea, uh, inland lake actually, in, in Finland, Saima. And the reason is not actually the ship that you see on it, but it's a smart fairway that you are seeing on this picture, although you wouldn't know it un unless I told you. And this picture is simulating remote pilotage, which is also being developed and tested at the moment. So, science facts, not science fiction. Um, I will now give over to um, Mr. Vegard Settelid from ABB, who will tell you a little bit about what they are doing today after my brief history session. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting me share what we do at ABB at this point. 
Uh, my name is Vegar Setli, Product Manager from uh, ABB at the Bridge uh, Solution. Um, yeah, let's get to it. I got 10 minutes to talk about what I fancy the most, so that will be hard, but let's see where we can go. Uh, first of all, let me introduce our ABB Ability Marine Pilot family, which is um, consisting of say two main parts. We have a uh, shore or cloud-based uh, control and awareness, and we have the onboard platform consisting of uh, pilot vision and pilot control. I don't care to say the whole ABB ability, marine pilot vision or pilot control all the time. We have the pilot vision giving, as I said, the uh, uh, awareness around the vessel. We look out assistance, docking assistance, collision avoidance and assistance and fairway assistance. The pilot control is a system uh, with the joystick and DP maneuverabilities. We have uh, possibility for auto crossing and docking and also uh, braking assistance, more or less as your ABS uh, braking on, on your car. Um, this combination will uh, build kind of the stepping stones toward the autonomy. Um, we have a couple of uh, short, nice videos that I hope we can present now. One for pilot uh, vision. Oh. With a 360 degrees overview of the vessel, ABB Ability Marine Pilot Vision provides a reliable and predictive lookout, reducing the potential for incidents. This enhances the overall safety of the crew and allows for an efficient marine operation. And one for pilot control. Designed for autonomous and remote operations, ABB Ability Marine Pilot Control enables optimal and complete all-speed vessel control from one operator position. This is a new way to control your vessel during all operational modes, including maneuvering, transit, and position keeping. So, that was uh, short videos there. Um, I have one more here, which I will talk about. This is the pilot uh, vision uh, shortly um, shown, um, giving the crew the ability to put uh, layers on top of camera views. Uh, we are having the buzzwords as uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, uh, giving you the uh, prediction of where the vessel is and uh, giving you the measurements as you go inshore. Uh, also with the lookout functionality to see the fairway and obviously giving the crew a lot of more information than uh, just look out the window. Um, moving on here, we can also have a small uh, collision avoidance here. Uh, the green line, what you see here is the plan track. Uh, we have a vessel uh, going to cross our track, so the system then calculates a new path that will avoid the vessel. And uh, when the decision is taken to follow that uh, new path, you see the vessel is now following the cyan colored uh, path here. And this is uh, more or less where we are today with uh, our systems. Uh, but then uh, the question of today is, uh, you know, uh, how do we operate in, in a normal way today? Uh, you see the bridge here, obviously uh, with uh, navigational aids as, as uh, GPS, radars, ECTIS, AIS. And we have one guy on the bridge called uh, Lookout or, or a girl. Um, I don't know the cost of this bridge somewhere in a million dollar class. Uh, our Lookout is grasping his binoculars. It's, uh, I don't know, 400 years old tool to get this uh, information that he really needs. Uh, he gets some information, of course, but not all the information that he requires. So then this guy, he will take all that uh, information that he sees through his binoculars and give that to the officer on the watch. And the officer on the watch, he will then take all of the information that he also gets from the navigational aids and decide what to do and taking decision on, on and possible risk mitigation actions like adjusting the speed or uh, the course and 
you know, some of these problems are, are that all of this is happening within and the human minds. And, and uh, so far, we are not able to share the human minds within the crew. So they are kind of different ways of interpreting the data. And uh, then another uh, kind of difficulties here is that, that uh, you cannot see small objects as a kayak or, or if it's too close to the system, it, it doesn't exist. So this is some of the uh, problems that, that we are overcoming with these new systems that we have now. And all of this uh, kind of, um, say, navigational aids on board, they are uh, subject to individual uh, interpretation of the data given. So uh, moving on a bit here. How do we do this then for the future? Um, we believe that uh, stepwise uh, is kind of the approach. We have different tasks ongoing at the bridge or in the operation now, which will be planning, uh, risk assessments, lookout, control. And today these are very manual tasks. Uh, they happen now and then. Uh, sometimes they happen uh, isolated from the rest of the operation and, and it could be complex operations. You have to do uh, manual movement of a vessel and so on. So I guess we are somewhere in between uh, these two uh, columns today. We start now with more assisted uh, uh, planning work. We have uh, more risk assessments ongoing at all time from the uh, different systems. And then with the uh, lookout now starting to be continuous and assisted as shown on the videos that the system now can look out on, on uh, say 360 degrees around the vessel at all time and they don't get uh, tired, they don't get uh, uh, caught up in another interesting things to look out. And then the control is also being more and more uh, assisted and simpler uh, joystick control instead of having a lot of uh, different levers to uh, operate with you have uh, a dp control and we also now have remote supported and remote controlled vessels as uh, demonstrated then the next step more and more into the automated world uh, i don't know if you look uh, everybody heard into guides uh, presentation but i really like this uh, part where you said that, that there are things that a uh, human has to do uh, still, and, and we are not uh, able to remove the, the humans from the operations. But we can assist them and we can have more automated and continuous uh, actions from the system and learning. Uh, <laughs> you, you can train the computers now to do different tasks that uh, they will never be kind of as good as a human being i believe in and and of course we can now also start being uh, as we have learned during covid we can do our work from home from the living room from the couch and so on i don't recommend operating an offshore vessel from your couch but uh, then in theory we are at the stage where, where that could be So uh, a bit into the market, how we see it will develop uh, gradually. Um, I said we are now uh, moving from the manual and more into assisted and, and remote. And then at the time we will also be more autonomous. But of course, putting uh, yeah, how many years, uh, I said uh, 30 years uh, from now, we will be more in the autonomous world. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, technology will uh, kind of develop exponentially as, as uh, talked about earlier today. One big thing is of course the cooperation with the legislations and all the different uh, law of the seas. Uh, we do have to find rules and regulations uh, that we all have to follow. One thing is to have one demo vessel uh, autonomous going from A to B, but when you have a full uh, harbor with, with many of those vessels, we need to follow the same rules and, and making sure that our different um, 
implementations of the rules are done more or less as the same way, so the vessel acts in the same way. A bit on uh, what we say in ABB, we strongly believe that our vessels will be electrical, digital and connected and uh, they will be integrated with automation control systems and, and we are already transforming the industry into this. We will have uh, digital solutions on board and transmitting real-time uh, data and uh, giving kind of comprehensive overview of the ships and, and performance uh, teams on board and onshore. And the connectivity makes all of this possible, uh, possible and, and getting advanced analytics also fed to the onshore part to maintain and, and optimize the operations. So, I think I stayed within 10 minutes, actually 30 seconds less. So that's what I have to say now. Thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to the rest of this show. Thank you very much, Vegard. Uh, just for your information, uh, if there are some questions that come up during the presentations, you can already write those questions into Slido because we will be coming back to those questions. So don't worry. Uh, You'll get some answers, I hope. <laughs> Next up uh, will be Peter Broadhurst from Inmarsat. I'm not promising any answers. <laughs> Too early. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to, to everybody from a sunny London. <laughs> not quite. Um, so my name is Peter Broadhurst. I'm the Vice President of uh, Safety and Security and Yachting and Passenger in the Maritime Business Unit. Um, I only have four slides, so I will be quick. I will be under my 10 minutes. Um, that's, a, that's a promise today. Um, I went to sea in 1984. I was a raid officer and I tapped a Morse key. And um, it's been very interesting the last day and a half to see some of the feedback that's happening around digitalization and uh, autonomy, what we were talking about here, and where we are on that, that slope. So I was at sea at the time when GMDSS came in, and, and I, my experience of it then was, as a radio officer and the radio officers I spoke to, it was God may decide to save someone. Uh, it was uh, everybody pushed against it. We didn't want it. Even captains didn't want it. They saw that it was uh, one of those things that was changing. But it's been very, very slow in the pace of change. But automation is coming. You know, um, I sailed on vessels that had autopilots. All vessels will have an autopilot. It replaced the AB at the wheel. Automation is coming. And the pace of change as we've seen from Gert and, and, and other presenters is increasing. What I'm going to go through today is uh, a couple of slides on how Inmarsat is facilitating that uh, through our digital program. Um, some of you who um, registered for this earlier would have, not, would have seen that Stefano Poli should have been doing this session. Unfortunately, Stefano can't be here today. Um, I am better looking than Stefano, so you've, you've got the, the best bet there. I'm sure he's online watching, so I'll just put that one in there. Um, and then the second section is a section that I uh, am very uh, passionate about, which is safety related. And the way that I think digital um, uh, can go forward with a proof of concept that we're running at this moment in time. And um, I think it's very uh, unique. It's, it's a novel, uh, as the IMO would, uh, would, would put it. It's one of those novel issues that we're bringing to the table. Um, in the last presentation, the safety of life at sea was put down there as legislation. That's going through a review at the moment and will be fi finalized by the IMO in 2024. And it's a four-year four life cycle. So the next time we could put autonomy into SOLAS would be 2028 at the earliest. So technology is moving faster than regulation. And I just want to show a little bit about where we are pushing to try and move that forward. So um, first of all, let's not fight against it. Um, we have put in a digital platform. But we know that shipping is used to having a primary connection with its IT services going in its primary connection. So why and try and fight it? So within our Fleets Express service, we've added the secondary channel. The secondary channel is there for those applications 
that you may want to use for um, IoT, for tracking, for all of those extra services, telemedicine that we spoke about, etc. So use your primary pipe like you have been doing for your IT and what's on board the vessel, but use the secondary pipe in a more uh, imaginative way in order to facilitate that. Also, let's not confuse the matter, let's call something fleet everything. So then we, it's very simple for everybody. It's fleet data, it's fleet connect, and it's fleet edge. So everything's called fleet, so there you go, that's our secondary services. The first one, fleet connect. So bring up a secondary uh, pipe, a secondary connection, that you can run as a on bandwidth demand type capability. So when you need that, for example, telemedicine application, you don't need it all the time, but bring it up when you need it, close it down when you don't need it. There's lots of applications we can do with that, and it doesn't interfere with your primary connection, which carries on doing all the things that you used to do in your primary. In the future, as we go through this digital transformation, I can see more bandwidth in the secondary pipe than I can in the primary pipe, because applications will drive the future. We've seen that in terms of, uh, again, the presenters over the last day and a half. So that's the first one. The second one is fleet data, the IoT of the ship's data, bringing that data back so you can use it for automation. But rather than bring it back, bring engine monitoring uh, data back and bring in uh, vessel tracking data back and bring in um, cargo monitoring data back, let's bring it all back in one pipe, put it in a cloud and use APIs to whoever you want to share that data with. One transmission for all the information. Why bring it back on separate, different, disparate type um, bandwidth for applications all the time? Bring it all back in one place, put it in the cloud, and you can share it with as many people as you want. It's more efficient, and it's more reliable in that respect. And the last one there is hosting. We talked about and we've, had, we've seen through the COVID, it's very hard to get new hardware on board a vessel. So let's host applications on our equipment, and that's what Inmarsat has done through its Fleet Edge product, to put those applications actually on board the vessel. You can pull the application on demand over that secondary pipe, put it on board the vessel, so you can run the application. Again, very efficient, it allows it easy to be upgraded, easy to be changed, etc. So our concept of all of this in enabling those application providers is to provide that second pipe. And this is the ecosystem. Because in Mossat, as you've heard from Clara and a few others, this is not about one entity doing this all by themselves. And we as an industry have a lot to, um, to achieve in a very short period of time. Again, as you've heard, on the decarbonisation type of things. So we have to bring this ecosystem of partners together. And that's what Clara, if you've not met Clara, that's what she's doing. She's bringing all of that together. That is where we're doing. And through our Fleet Data Academy that Ronald mentioned again this morning, we are facilitating this. So we, we have the solution today. A lot of, you know, we had this concept of, is it, is it the future or is it actually here now? It is here now. And these are our, our providers that are helping us move forward. I'm very happy to work with others. So in this concept, from my perspective, when I was looking with the digital team, I was saying, well, if we connect the VDR on board a vessel, why can't we bring everything from the VDR back? In my safety, um, with my safety hat on, I talk to a lot of people from the Marine Accident Investigation Bureau. It takes a long, long time to get that data out, uh, out of uh, VDRs when vessels uh, are um, involved in an incident. Um, I talk to rescue coordination centers. I talk to search and rescue authorities about all the ecosystem that goes on. The more information you have at the time, the better. So I said, why can't we bring the whole VDR and put that in the cloud? Now you don't want to do that all the time. Why would you need all that data if you're not going to use it? But what you can do, and it says there on the last paragraph, in the case of an anomaly, take all that data from the VDR and put it in the cloud. 
So what's an anomaly? An anomaly is when a captain and the crew are doing and going about their duty to keep that vessel safe. I've been on a vessel that's listed at 40 degrees. It stays there for a little while, but then it comes back. But if it stayed there for a long period of time, that's an anomaly. That's not right. Something's wrong. And that crew are going to be doing everything they possibly can to get that ship upright. But more than likely, the cargo shifted. Let's dump the VDR, put it in the cloud. If a vessel is sailing at 12 knots and it decelerates faster than it possibly could, it is grounded or it's had a collision. That's an anomaly. Again, the crew are going to be trying to do whatever they've got to do. But let's tell somebody that something's gone wrong. Let's be proactive about this. Now, those are just a couple of scenarios that I've shared. This is a proof of concept. It's on the Coral Pearl. You can see on the top, top graph the points, and that's just the fleet data service. So it's just given us position. It shows a few, few parameters there around wind speed, course over ground, etc. And it's nothing new. But below it is the full VDR. And we can see in real time what's going on on board that vessel. We can also see the GPS, uh, sorry, the, the well, GPS, the, the radar, the ECK disk, and on the next slide I'll show you the AIS targets. This is the full information. This is really strong and powerful stuff. And it's given us that time to evaluate the situation and maybe assist this vessel better than we do today. Because we know from the number of distresses that we get, it's when the captain presses the distress, that's the point that they're going to say, it's too late now, guys. We as a crew can't do anything. Nobody can help us. We, we want assistance and away from here. The more time we can buy, those critical minutes would help us. One of those things is because we've brought that VDR data back, we've got all the AIS targets. I can now see directly which is the closest vessel to support that vessel. So I now can, click, uh, can get the data of the vessel that's closest by to the vessel that's had the anomaly, and I can contact them as a rescue coordination center over the services that we provide for free and allow them to say, can you keep an eye out and tell me what's going on on that vessel over there if you can't get hold of the vessel? Because you've got the vessel details, you'd be phone, you, you could phone that vessel. But that vessel and the crew on it are doing everything they possibly can to, do, to keep that vessel in a safe, as a safe asset. This is not uh, fiction, it's fact. We're doing it as a proof of concept. It works. We're pulling the data back. I showed this to the IMO. I think this is a great way to go in terms of proactive uh, monitoring of a vessel and bringing data back. Putting it in the cloud and sharing it with all the people. It's food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next on, we are going to hear from um, Jon Bernard Hestmark from Kongsberg. Uh, and let's see what their view is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Kongsberg to this session on the autonomy and renewable operative technology. Today we've seen uh, a set of uh, new technology that is very exciting. But why are you developing this technology? Before I answer this, let us go back in time. The maritime domain has always been part of my life. I started sailing Optimist dinghy when I was eight. By the time I was 12, most weekends were spent sailing uh, in contests. As a boy, summer meant sailing across Europe in our sailboat called Zigzag. This opened up my eyes to the wonders and diversity of the maritime world. I joined the Royal Norwegian Navy in 1999, where I sailed as a navigator on combat boat 90N before studying cybernetics at the university. So why is my background important looking at autonomy? I believe it is why and how we apply technology in the maritime context that is important. Technological advances have always been adopted by the maritime world. To ensure safety at sea, we need to understand the technology, but also take a holistic view on the maritime operations. It is the narrative of a ship's operation that is key to ensure safety and efficiency. 
This helps us identify the key elements in the operation, what can be improved and what is critically important to ensure that no harm comes to environment, human health, property or resources. So let us take a closer look at two examples to understand how the same technology can be used in different narratives. Buster Fusen is a company in Norway operating Norway's most busy ferry connection with six vessels, yearly transporting 1.8 million vehicles and 37 million passengers between the ports Moss and Hotten. In the following video, you will get a better understanding of how autonomous functions uh, boost their operational performance. Please play the video. We have been uh, on board uh, Bosta uh, 6 and we have witnessed the first uh, adaptive transit with passengers on board ever. So this is a world first. It's a really big day for all of the involved parties, Kongsberg, Bosta Fulsen and of course also the Norwegian Maritime Authorities. This is a project we have together with Kongsberg and the main goal of the project is that it is uh, fokus på säkerheten. Vi menar att detta system med automatisk överfart och docking eh, ska öka säkerheten eh, till eh, våra passagerare och manskap. Eh, det ska också på något sätt bättre hela logistiken i sambandet. Vi har ett större du har större nyaktighet i systemet som gör att du kan komma in egentligen akkurat på förhandsprogrammerade tidspunkt du vill. Det betyder att vi vill ha möjligheten till övervåka på ett helt annat vis. Så vi har ett system som hela tiden ligger och för fartöje där vi önskar att komma. Vi vill kunna följa med på instrumenten på trafik runt oss på en mer effektiv måte. Overvåka sig lasen. We can uh, supervise, we can facilitate, but we cannot produce and we will not produce. Så so vi have to see that uh, the achievement that we see, the new th technology that grow ahead. Uh, is uh, is sustainable and it's it's safe, secure, and in an environmental uh, friendly uh, manner. Okay. So, in the video, you saw the mission for Buster Horton to transport vehicles and passengers safely and efficiently. Why then invest in autonomy? First and foremost, regularity. Auto docking and auto truck helps them keep a tight time schedule, minimizing delays. Secondly, smooth acceleration and just in time arrival means less fuel consumption, giving reduced CO2 emissions. Thirdly, the workload on the bridge is reduced so the crew can spend more time on situation awareness. This balancing of tasks between man and machine is what we like to call haba maba. Humans are best at, machines are best at, maximizing the performance of man and machine as a team. My second example is still under development. Reach Subsea and Kongsberg are working on an unmanned surface vessel operating from the west of Norway out into the North Sea. Please play the video. The sea is the future and it needs intelligent, clean and efficient solutions. Reach Subsea has a solid history of disruptive technology. Now introducing Reach Remote, an innovative solution for over the horizon unmanned subsea operations. Together with our partners Masterly and Kongsberg, we're taking the next step, transforming the subsea industry. Remote control of vessels and ROVs is a natural evolution made possible by technology. We have combined human interaction with engineering and risk management to reach a sustainable next generation subsea solution. A robust unmanned surface vessel and ROV, fully connected, managed by reliable control systems under human supervision. REACH Remote is capable of performing an unrivaled range of survey, intervention and inspection services. 
With advanced tools, sensors, and communication systems, we provide the information needed for accurate decision-making. We are on a mission to deliver competitive and carbon-efficient subsea operations that ensures a safe work environment for all personnel. We welcome you to explore this maritime adventure. The sea is the future, and everything you need is within reach. So, as we saw, for each, the mission is to collect sensor data and operate tools using a remotely operated vehicle. This change in mission purpose opens up for a different solution. By making the vessel unmanned, we can reduce the size to 24 meters compared to a traditional 100 meter supply vessel. This translates into 90% reduction in CO2 emissions. Working from a remote operating center, specialists and crew no longer need to spend months at sea from family and friends. This improves welfare and keeps maintaining a healthy work-life balance. The operation is more efficient at, as specialists and crew do not need to wait in transit because of bad weather or other reasons. It is no doubt that this last example challenges the way we traditionally think of maritime operations. Is it safe? Are the risks tolerable? Does this support a sustainable future? Yes, if you get the priority right. The future is about people. Technology such as autonomy should always help the human. Reducing emissions, increasing efficiency must be balanced by safe operations and securing meaningful jobs for people. Therefore, I have devoted the last part of this talk to a great team I've been very fortunate to work with. Our strength lies in our diversity. Together, we seek to find how autonomous and remote technology safely can be used within the existing ISM code framework. Slide, please. We are taking a holistic approach, looking at the intersection between maritime rules, ship operation, and advanced technology. The team has experts from legislation, class society, ship management, officers, maritime law, maritime education, and technology development. We feel that we have matured greatly over the past few years. The adaptation of autonomy and remote operations in the maritime domain is happening now. It will coexist in an environment mainly occupied by traditional vessels operated by humans. I'm glad to see companies such as APB, Virtula, Seekit, Imarsat, and Kongsberg are taking part in this journey together, improving operational performance, reducing CO2 emissions in a safe and secure manner. Together, we are creating solutions for existing and future generations around the world. Carefully, and holistically integrating autonomy and remote technology so that we can safely teach our kids to sail a dinghy. In my case, in Moss, where an eight-year-old boy in Optimist dinghy could share the fjord with the Buster ferries. And my kids safely can, even though the ferries now operate with autonomous technology. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jan Bernard. Uh, next up, we have um, actually um, a presenter uh, which has been pre-recorded. Uh, Ashley Sket from Sea Skit is um, on board a ship at the moment, and I guess they don't have Inmasat connection there <laughs> because um, there were some connection issues. So, um, but we are lucky because the presentation was pre-recorded. So we're going to see it, and um, it, with luck, we might have also uh, Mr. Sket in the panel, but let's see. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Sket. I'm the Director of Operations at Seeker International. It's a pleasure to be talking to you at this, uh, this event, and uh, I'm basically going to talk about uh, what we do, uh, a, a little bit of history, and then um, I thought I'd take this uh, unique opportunity to uh, walk you through the remote control center. That's the uh, uh, the base uh, where we control our vessels from. And 
basically give you a bit of an inside view into what the operator sees as they are driving our vessels around. But um, uh, first of all, let's have a look at uh, a quick video just to show you uh, a little bit about us. Imagine a flexible, resilient marine platform that can stay at sea for weeks on end and perform multiple missions all on its own. No need to imagine. The uncrewed surface vessels of the future are already here. These award-winning vessels are designed for versatility, endurance and above all, efficiency. Propelled by two hybrid systems, they can go more than a month without refueling. With two onboard generators for redundancy and a 140 kilowatt hour battery bank, the vessels can remain on station for extended periods of time in near total silence. Solar panels can be added to boost these capabilities even further. As these vessels are uncrewed, there is no need to make room for a galley or accommodation. Using a diverse range of resilient communication channels, the vessels can be remotely controlled from anywhere in the world, which makes these USVs the perfect long-range configurable platform with an open bay to carry, launch and recover a variety of vehicles and payloads. Like AUVs or UUVs which dive as far as 6,000 meters below the surface and can be launched and recovered autonomously allowing multiple dives on a single mission. The same vessels can also deploy a tethered ROV. While acting as a relay system so that the ROV can be remotely operated on tasks ranging from mine countermeasures and underwater cable repair to detailed seabed surveys. And with no crew on board to house, feed or rotate, Sea Kit's USVs can keep station for extended periods, offering a dynamic and robust platform for remote surveillance, or for charting the ocean depths with a multi-beam echo sounder, as this one did on a recent Atlantic voyage, transiting over 1,200 nautical miles to successfully survey more than 400 square miles of previously uncharted ocean floor before returning to port with its fuel tank still around a third full. Welcome home. Built and shaped to fit inside a standard shipping container for rapid deployment, this revolutionary vessel won the prestigious Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize. The, the experience that X Prize has given us is without doubt uh, extremely important in what we're doing now. We've been able to go out there, prove the concepts, not only through X Prize but commercially as well, and getting that experience offshore is. is very, very rare. Designed and manufactured right here in the UK, Sea Kit's uncrewed surface vessels are tailored specifically to clients' needs. Right at the front of the boat there, you can see an opening which is where it goes into the comms room. There's a huge amount of electronics uh, and uh, equipment goes up there for running not only the ship systems but the payload systems as well. We're also developing a larger class called the Amiga class, which is a 24 meter vessel able to carry up to 25 tonnes, more payloads, deeper waters, faster, but also of the bigger vessel, maybe more challenging waters. This is the control suite where we operate the vessels. The ship's captains and necessary qualified people do have to be on a bridge, are making the decisions for the vessel, but they can do it on any time zone, which is uh, really exciting. Long room, uh, this is USV Maxima Remote Ops. Uh, we are following on, uh, departing the Churn Chapel Wharf and heading out into the Sound. Uh, no persons on board ever. The flexible, uncrewed surface vessels of the future are already here, delivering on complex commercial offshore tasks around the world. Sea Kit International redefining the way we work offshore. It's clear that uncrewed vessels are set to play a prominent role in our future and uh, the future of maritime inspection and survey in the, you know, in the immediate and their long term into much wider applications. Um, the benefits of remote technology are are significant. There, there are a number of them. Um, faster, efficient uh, inspection and safer and more sustainable uh, operations are the, are the, are the key 
uh, advantages to the, to this uh, technology. Um, the, the, the thing to recognize here is that this is uh, happening now. It, it's, uh, these vessels are out there. These, this slide that you can see in front of me, although it's an animation, it's, uh, uh, it's happening in the real world currently uh, with our vessels in Australia um, and in Aberdeen. Uh, we're remotely launching and recovering an ROV, as you can see here, um, doing a, a, a OFE uh, inspection. Uh, and also, also a bathymetric survey, as you can see with the vessel on the right. This is these vessels are out there do, doing this work right now. Um, the team in Perth, operating our one of our vessels, recently won a innovation award uh, from the government uh, for the work they've been doing recently with Woodside, which is uh, which, which is quite quite an achievement. Um, so th this this picture really kind of uh, emphasizes that uh, that the, the difference between the uh, the one way of doing things and the new way of, of doing these inspections um, that although obviously the, the bigger boat can launch bigger ROVs and therefore can, has a wider scope of work in this particular occasion when this photo was taken they were doing the, the same job they were doing a, a, both vessels were performing a, a pipeline inspection um, uh, off the coast of Norway. Uh, so, I mean, immediately you can, you can see the, uh, the, the savings in the build and the project costs, um, the mobiliz mobilization costs, the crewing costs, um, but uh, more importantly for us is the, the, you know, the, the carbon savings that, that, are, that are quite obvious by operating as a, a much smaller vessels. And, and, and those numbers are, are clear to see in, on that slide. Uh, so that's just a, a, a bit of a background, um, but uh, I'd like to kind of focus in um, on the control center. We currently have one set up actually on board the uh, HMS Albion, which is uh, berthed in the Thames. Um, but uh, I, I'm just going to show you what the, op what the operator sees as they're uh, driving these vessels around. Um, although uh, they you know that there's some advanced sensors out there um automatic target identification is not yet possible so when we're talking about the coal regs you know the ability to keep a proper lookout at sea by sight and hearing yeah, in, in all circumstances uh to avoid the risk of collision um although the the the, the technology is, is is out there to be able to uh potentially achieve that in the future and you know we're not a huge way off that at the moment uh, it's very much operator in the loop and uh, our, our view is the operator is the, well, the the one responsible for keeping a lookout using as much technology as possible to to uh, allow that um, so we have multiple cameras on board um, and you know they, they give the, obviously an, an all-round view um, uh, for for the operator uh, they can the definition can be changed to uh, optimize the uh, the connection type that we're using if you're using vsat you have to kind of um, put that to a level where it's not saturating the the, the amount of bandwidth you have available so we might be streaming one frame every second, for example, at, a, at a, a higher quality. If you're streaming high quality frames uh, multiple times a second, then you start to suffer bandwidth issues. It's the nature of satellite communication. Um, so there's other things to consider, such as the layout of the of, of the, the cameras. And um, so here you've got the the port camera on the left, starboard camera on the right. You can you've got your your forward facing as the the major screen, and then uh, the uh, aft facing as a kind of inset on that screen. But with those, they they can be laid out how, however you you choose. Um, there's redundancy to think about. Um, so uh, you know what happens if a a bird decides to poo on your camera, and then <laughs> you need to. Uh, uh, have measures in place to mitigate against that. And we have a, a pan tilt zoom um, uh, for thermal imaging camera, which also has a daylight mode. So that can be, uh, that can act as any 
any view if 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 you do lose uh, a camera. Uh, the, the biggest thing to remember with the cameras is it's not natural really for an operate for well for anyone to uh, stare at a, a a TV screen that is not always uh, changing. Um, so you really have to, as an operator, train yourself to do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a mental thing that uh, you, you have to uh, tell yourself to focus on those TV images, whereas if you're on board the vessel, it would be more natural to look out the window. Um, so what other senses do we have on board? Um, obviously, positioning is uh, one of our most important. Uh, and uh, we use a uh, type approved ECDIS package that we've had um, modified to uh, to use with our vessel. It will send con control commands and uh, receives uh, ad additional information, allows us to com uh, compose routes um, smartly and send them directly to the vessel directly from the ECDIS package, which is quite an important mission planning tool. Um, and in terms of the positioning itself, we've got multiple GNSS uh, sensors on board. Um, with uh, uh, we have trialed backups to that as well. So if your if your satellite gets blocked for whatever reason, if you're operating near wind turbines or rigs, then uh, you need redundancy. So we've also explored uh, on two previous projects uh, using. Uh, INS uh, backup as well for, for bottom tracking positioning, which is, uh, you know, it's all about redundancy. Everything we do with these vessels is all about having a backup means for, uh, for everything. Um, the uh, radar and AIS uh, with, with you know, AIS overlay is obviously essential. You use the radar much more uh, on these vessels than you do on uh, man vessels because you will see a target uh, probably on the radar before you see it uh, physically on, on, on the camera. So the, the radar is, is really important. We use the tried and tested uh, system with, with, which is which operates exactly as if the uh, you were on board the vessel with the, with the same levels of definition. Uh, we record all the environmental conditions, really important. Um, and, and all of that, importantly, is is always stored in the cloud. So you can actually go back to any point in time during an operation, and uh, and see what the what the conditions were, um, and and that goes for every single uh, bit of data that that we have uh, on on the vessel, such as batteries, thrusters, RPMs, etc. Everything is is recorded, uh, and um, because we tie that in. With the operator accounts when they're using our control system, it, you know it, you can get a very clear picture of what was happening happening at every point in time during an, an operation. Um, we also remotely control the VHF and DSC systems, um, and that also uh, provides our sound link. Obviously, uh, very important when you refer again back to the coal regs. Uh, to uh, be able to stay in VHF comms with uh, other vessels for collision avoidance, but um, also safety uh, reasons. Uh, and then, as I said, this is our sound system. So it's a two-way sound system. We can hear the environment, what's around us. We can hear what's going on board on, on the ship. From my time at sea, uh, I, I know you always hear a problem before you see it. Uh, and, and the sound is so important for, for knowing when something's wrong. But not only that, it provides a live link to the vessel. It puts that operator on board that ship and, and keeps them in tune with, uh, with, with what's going on. So uh, the, 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 the sound is, um, yeah, it, 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 it's key really to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, a live link because uh, as well, if you do have connection problems, if there's a slow connection, then that sound will drop out. That's an early warning sign for, for the. Um, so this brings us now to our um, G Savvy control screen. This this is our unique software that, that, that we've developed for operating our vessel. There's a, there's a lot of information here in one screen. I'll try and breathe through it fairly quickly. 
and and show you what's what's going on. Here you have the um, the uh, diagrams, vessel diagrams, showing you the position of all the thrusters, showing you where the power is going, such as you know generators, batteries being linked together, um, and uh, you know pumps running. All, all of that is, is shown on the internal diagram, and then we show what lights we've got on on uh, on the ship and um, and the, the state of those switches. It, it's uh, it's quite important we feel for for this this kind of diagram explanation uh, because you can't just kind of look out the window and see what nav lights you've got on you, you kind of need that um that prominent display uh visible at all times when you when you're operating these these vessels and just in the top right corner of that box you can see a uh a, a, it's a it's actually a timer frozen and uh, if that link is lost to the vessel, that time will start counting down from 15 seconds. When it gets to zero, the vessel goes into position hold mode, um, and uh, the the operator will see that go to zero, and they will know that their con connection has been lost. It, as soon as that timer starts counting down, that's telling you that you've got a loss of connection, and you'll see the, sc the screen will completely change. It will go blank, basically. So it's very obvious when the connection has been lost. Um, and obviously that fail safe into position holding is, is actually critical to the uh, safety functions of the boat. At the top you've got your um, control bar showing you who's in control in the middle, uh, the position of the vessel obviously, and your um, the ability to give up control or take control. Very critical to, uh, to be aware that only one operator can be in control of this boat at any one time. And then in the top right, uh, sorry, the top left corner, you can see uh, two uh, two symbols with an A next to them. They're telling you that the primary um, computer in that instance is connected. We've got backup for every computer on board. If one goes down, it will automatically change to the B computer. Uh, on the right are all our switches. Every single bit of um, equipment on there can be switched on and off. Very simple. That goes um, out into a whole another window if you need it. Um, very easy to add and remove equipment um, as required as well. And then this, these are our data widgets. They can be changed in the settings to any number of over uh, 80 data points that we have coming from, from, coming from the vessel. Um, obviously, you don't need to see all of that, but uh, the critical bits you can choose from, uh, uh, from the drop down. And those gauges are configurable when required and fixed when required as well. So when we talk about the gen sets here, our, our control panel for the generators, those those values are uh, on those graphs are, are fixed. And so it's very clear to see the, the, the optimum um, operating parameters and, and when uh, that, that, uh, that those generators are performing as, as they should. And if there's any issues, uh, they flag up as alarms, as you can see on the example in the middle of the starboard hull 67, it's in red. That's an example of the alarms. The alarms are very configurable as well. We can set them to any one of our data points. And then the main part at the at the bottom of the screen is our direct controls. We can select our headings, speeds. Um, we can uh, perform emergency stops. We've got all of our RPMs and our, our the angles of our thrusters coming through there as well. And the, the heading can be selected in a number of ways, just by clicking the dial or typing it in or dragging the uh, the arrow point slider around as well. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got the uh, uh, control modes. So we can uh, put in heading mode, which is just like using an autopilot um, on board a boat. You just press a heading and you go. Uh, we've got uh, a follow mode. We can automatically track a target, such as a, an ROV or an AUV in the water. We can tell the boat to hold position as well. Um, as a kind of virtual anchor, we also have actually a physical anchor on board, which we can uh, deploy if we. If, uh, it's more of a last resort, but it's uh, it's quite a nice nice to have. Um, we can uh, engage route following mode. Then we set a load of parameters for how we want the vessel to follow a route. These these vessels have been designed for survey, so they're they're, they're very high accurate um, route following with with with, the, with many parameters. Uh, to achieve that in, in varying sea states. Um, and then 
we can uh, select or deselect thrusters. We've got three thrusters on board, so extremely maneuverable, but uh, you, you know, quite high power consumption if you're using all typically, we just use um, the forward ASI pod thruster for position holding and then the aft thrusters for uh, making making way and, and transiting. And then very importantly, at the, the bottom right of the screen is the connection state to, uh, to all the systems, which is, uh, um, yeah, your your kind of live feed as to as as to to which which systems are online and which uh, which aren't, uh, and that's pretty much it. Very brief. Uh, hopefully, uh, enjoyed having a bit of an insight into what an operator sees. Um, this this slide is is a bit about our future. We we have two, both a twenty four meter and a thirty six meter uh, on the drawing board. Um, and as I said, this is a this this particular image is the uh, uh, logistics option. It can be you know these these vessels are very agnostic. Um, but uh, no, I look, look forward to um, answering any questions on the uh, on the panel. Thank you. Okay, so let's hope that Ashley will be able to join us in the panel. But right before the panel, still we have. Uh, Mr. Clayton van Welter from Wärtsilä, who will shortly tell a little bit about what Wärtsilä is doing currently. Seems do not have a voice here. Hmm, we can check that. Now do I have a voice? <laughs> excellent, excellent. So good afternoon again. Uh, we'll do, try this time with audio. Uh, I, I delivered some really you know, eloquent message, but now, now I've got to restart. So now I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all um, virtually and uh, to be on this panel with all these other wonderful companies and associations that, that are here today. Um, Oh, I really, I'm here today to share a little bit about our journey towards autonomy that we're taking. Uh, and due to the nature of our organization, our journey really embodies many different starting points. Uh, but however, there's one nice illustration that I really like to pull up on the screen here that represents a little bit of an origin story, right? So here you have one of the first track pilot systems being tested. And so a track pilot system is an automated form of, uh, of a ship following a, a track. And uh, this track here is, is coming around. So the ship is there and it's following this little planned route. And, and what, I, what I really like about the, the image is that the satellite positioning obviously around this time was not as strong as, uh, as we have it today. Uh, so the engineers were actually using dead reckoning uh, and ground tracking uh, speed logs and a military grade compass in order to achieve this kind of solution. And I find this picture so great because it offers many parallels to kind of the challenges that we're facing today on this journey. And it's similar there where they were pushing the boundaries of certain technologies, novel applications of others, and assembling them in order to provide one comprehensive and workable solution. Uh, the picture also kind of gives you hope that what was kind of this big barrier, such as positioning, global positioning, is now turned into such a strength for us. Um, and it really shows, again, how much of a journey we're on. If you look, this was 1989, uh, and here we are today. We're, we're not really going towards this kind of big bang moment where all of a sudden everything is autonomous or remote. We're, we're on this journey. And the journey consists primarily of identifying and maturing the kind of autonomous and RCC capabilities. Uh, and, and then you assemble these individual capabilities in order to provide these, these solutions. And so we at Varzilla really believe in this, this smart marine ecosystem. And I've never eaten an elephant, but I've heard that the best strategy to eat an elephant, right, is to take one bite at a time. And so this in illustration really shows how you can modularize uh, an approach to safe and green autonomous and remote operations, um, allowing you know various levels of maturity to come together at the right time in order to deliver the needed solution and ultimately achieving that desired level of autonomous or remote operations for that particular time. Uh, let's take a couple look uh, at our steps that we've taken along along this journey most recently. 
So we started with the raw capability to remotely control uh, a vessel. And in 2017, we developed the capability to dock and undock a vessel uh, completely in an automated manner. And then 2019 saw a major effort in Singapore with the project called IntelliTug. And this really helped us refine our situational awareness, our collision avoidance algorithms. And most importantly, it really showed that there's a huge benefit in pulling these testing with simulators in order to fast prototype alongside your kind of real world, real world testing at the same time. More recently, uh, in 2020, we launched the Smart Move uh, program, which really begins, you'll, as you'll see here in a second, to assemble many automated capabilities together in order to provide this more comprehensive solution. But before I dive into all the tech, we really got to start out with what are the customer needs. So we start with those customer needs, and then we got to make the technology fit. And for this customer, in this particular case, Right, we uh, the customer really wanted to keep safety at the core of their operation, in addition to finding new ways to enhance that safety and really higher risk operations. The middle picture is a chart of the Cuyahoga River, and that's in uh, Cleveland, and we're fitting a really large cargo ship down that, and that's hard and challenging at the best of times. They were looking for means to add more consistency to that operation. And all of this together ultimately drives your competitiveness. So not only did we look at how do we approach this river and optimize it uh, using technology, but we also looked at more or less the, their, their larger uh, supply chain ad, and were able to really then narrow down on could they even carry more cargo further upstream and, and delivered on that as well. So let's uh, take a couple, of, let's take a little peek at what we've got here on the technology side. So here we have a uh, Laker ship and the, the vessel here is going to be departing and entering into its smart move program. So I'll start it here. Beautiful sunrise as we head up the river in an automated fashion. So the vessel here again, as I mentioned, is in smart move and it's driving along its uh, precisely along its course as laid out in the chart. As we continue to move up the river, of course, we reach many, many bridges. And here is where the bridges really come into kind of a problem area as it relates to uh, a nice clean GNSS signal or a, a satellite positioning signal. So the little graph down at the bottom shows what we were receiving from our, our, our satellite navigation system in terms of uh, position. And you can see how the uh, position is really uh, a lot of discrepancy there. And the orange line that kind of goes through that is being delivered by our scene scan laser positioning system that's able to read the scene around it and understand where the vessel is. So it's giving a much more consistent position, which as you can see in these very tight places is, is needed. So we proceed further up the river. And again, in our nice and automated fashion, we also have a bow lookout function that's being provided uh, 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 based on the bow of the vessel. And that's coming back uh, to, the, uh, to the bridge and helping the lookouts and, the, and uh, the personnel on the bridge to better identify, more quickly identify um, objects or targets and, and individuals and hazards uh, out from the, the bow of the vessel. And as you can see, we continue to make our way up the river. Uh, it's a beautiful day today, but as the conditions, as we all know at sea and in these little rivers can vary with currents and tides and so forth, you end up uh, having facing varying challenges throughout each time you're going up. No journey is the same. So as we come along, smart dock system kicks in and we bring the vessel in alongside and we achieve that really in a very automated fashion. That was a very centric view from, from the vessel and automating processes that exist on the ship. I wanna to speak to you just finally here around remote operations center. And I use the term figuratively, figuratively speaking because it, it, it's potentially not one center, right? It's a dispersed manner of working. 
But all the same, what we're doing as we look to add more autonomy potentially in the future is you can really start to break up what was an existing model of operating ships. So here in this graph, at the top, we have our fleet management who are empowered through much cleaner analytics and much more powerful insight into their vessel's operations and unprecedented control over that due to the, the nature of the vessel. And then we move into our nautical operations. And this is where the nautical operations, we've separated that into two tiers. One tier I think we're, we're relatively familiar with, which is the direct control of a vessel from a remote instance. The monitoring aspect of being in the nautical operations is where you're in a one-to-many. So the control level of uh, direct control of a vessel is quite frankly, that that is your most basic and base level of operating the ship and is a real good fallback. But then as we add more autonomous capabilities or you're in areas of lower activity, you start to unlock the potential to control many vessels at one time using potentially only one operator. And that's where the business case begins to evolve even further. So here in this case, we've left the port and our nautical team is taking that ship out, takes it to its next port in the unlikely event that something is happening, you're having the remote dialing capabilities from an on-site uh, engineer. And then the ship is arriving in port, at which place it's then being handed over from the nautical teams over to the port and the technical operation teams. So the port, these are specialized teams. The port operations folks are the ones that are looking after the real interface between the ship and the port. While the technical teams, they could be OEM, they could be another business, they could be part of the owners. They are then handling the maintenance and repair of the vessel, which could have even been pre-ordered while it was out at sea. So then once the ship is loaded and ready to go and the maintenance team has signed off, the vessel is passed back to the nautical operations for the next journey. Just a potential vision of what, what awaits us in the future. So if we think back to that screenshot of, uh, of the ship in 1989 in the track mode, you know, the, the journey is, has been great and has been filled with a lot of fun. And we look forward to even more steps to take. So thank you. Uh, I see we have almost full panel. Ashley apparently wasn't able to connect, but that's fine. We have uh, several experts here. And since the time is running, and I know that Booz is waiting, so <laughs> uh, I'm going to go straight into uh, some of the questions that you have put out there. Um, I'm going to start with a um, question by Lisa Moore. Um, Autonomous shipping and unmanned vessels remotely managed is groundbreaking. However, what happens when advanced technologies inevitably go wrong? How can we ensure a safe work environment for all as adoption, adoption increases and traditional vessels are phased out? And so um, I see that we have actually Clayton first here. So if we go from Clayton to Vegard and then to Jan Bernard and Peter, if that's okay with you. Can you start Clayton? Yeah, great. No, thank you for that. And of course, safety is at the core of what we're trying to do here. If we can't do it safely, we're not doing it. And when we look at the regime that's in place in order to introduce these technologies, we really end up with a multi-layered approach in order to deliver the safety. So we follow established processes for introducing a new technology, whether that's technology qualification processes and so forth, but in close partnership, with the regulators, as well as uh, very, very good testing regimes and so forth. I feel this multifaceted approach towards introducing the, uh, the, the technology in that stepwise fashion is something that's going to lead to safety uh, at, at the core of this whole experience. Thank you. How about you, Vegard? Uh, do you want to add something? <laughs> Yeah, I, I support you there, Clayton. I think this uh, stepwise approach is, is important, but there is also something about, uh, as I briefly mentioned, is the, the sharing of uh, information in between different vessels. Uh, as you said, when, when you have one vessel doing uh, trials, it, it's okay to, to have that as a, 
a separated uh, kind of operation. But when you have these multiple vessels in the same areas, they have to go within the same rules and regulations. You have the call regs. We have to implement the algorithms, and and you know that that's uh, touching into the core of of companies, uh, IPs, and and so on. But at some level, we need to ensure that we have this implementation in in the same manner and. You know, it could be the testing regime is, is set up to the same simulator or something like that. But it's a, it's a difficult question, actually. And I, I know the was mentioned the same kind of uh, problem uh, or, or question uh, in the automotive uh, business where, where who, who should we uh, blame when, when the Tesla dries off or the or the e-trons or, or whatever and it's it's the same for uh, for the shipping industries and and it's something that i think we as a as a provider of these technologies we, we need to cooperate and, and make sure we are following the same implementation and the same rules and releg uh, legislations on this one okay so you are actually i think very much on the same page uh, how about Jan bernard <laughs> Do you want yeah, to add something? I agree, I agree with the panel. I uh, totally agree with everything that's been said. Um, we spent quite a lot of time on this safety part because we're pushing the boundaries a bit on some of our concepts. And I would think, I think the aerospace industry is very mature on this. They have something called a TRL level, technology readiness level. And it talks about how you take new technology and gradually introduces into a, a operational scene. So it goes from one to nine. So if you don't know it, please look into it. And um, I think we could learn a lot from that industry. And they're very, very professional when it comes to incidents and things that can happen. Uh, so that's also a, a layered or a, or, or a stepwise approach. But let's look at other industries. Um, that's the one thing I think about. The other thing is, I think human elements, uh, human element is extremely important. That's why I spend so much time in presentation on that, because we tend to say that human make errors, but often it is a system that is not designed according to human elements that is causing the human to make errors. And by combining machine and humans in the correct manner, we can actually improve on that. But the machine needs a human and the machine can help, help the, uh, the human again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Peter, you look at it from a little bit of a different angle, I think. Uh... Um, now, Lisa's uh, framed a very important question, in all fairness. You know, um, there is a drive to autonomous shipping, and the traditional shipping, if we want to call it that, uh, of today uh, has evolved over hundreds of years. Uh, and we do have the rules and regulations, and, and you can't switch one off and switch the other one on. And um, as we move to autonomous shipping, there will be also a drive to reduce the crew on the vessel as well. So there are lots of um, aspects that need to be um, considered before we can uh, keep that safe environment. But uh, I agree with the, with the panel. We do have rules and regulations today, and safety has to be at the highest. Even a vessel with no, no crew on board, you know, if it's, if it's carrying... Um, a cargo that could cause environmental damage is, is just as, 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 as a trouble as anything else. So um, it's going to be difficult, it's going to take time, it's going to ensure the processes as well as the, uh, the technology are, are there and maybe, maybe it will drive uh, transparency in today's market because we still don't know the number of problems we have at sea, the, not everything is reported. Uh, as it's been shown today, the, the number of uh, fatalities at sea, the number of um, incidents, uh, close call incidents and all those, and not all of it is reported. So we have to know the full picture. So may maybe it will actually drive traditional shipping to a safer point as well. Yeah. Let's hope. Okay. So we are kind of being the rabbit, hmm? <laughs> getting uh, traditional shipping into shape as well. Uh, let's hope that, yeah. <clears throat> uh, there is a question here um, for Clayton. Um, it says, Clayton, what would be Vatsila Milestone or your latest technology in 2021? 
<laughs> natural, natural, natural uh, head on to the next one, is it? Yeah, we we've got uh, a couple of irons in the in the fire, so to speak. But uh, there's there's many different tracks that are uh, underway. Uh, I do want to emphasize, right, that it's about developing these capabilities uh, in in kind of uh, I wouldn't say isolation, but certainly not trying to always do the full package always uh, individually and taking the projects that will a little bit further advance. Right now, we are certainly looking at the uh, connectivity side of things um, and the relationship that exists around situational awareness in areas of, of lower connectivity versus high activity and higher act, um, connectivity needs. So these are these are the next kind of where you start to patch, as you can see, certain projects that we've got, patch them together through greater connectivity and so forth. That's a little bit where our, our mindset is at this time. Okay, thanks Clayton. Now, this is an interesting question because we've talked today a lot about uh, navigation. Uh, actually, in the publicity, when you sometimes listen to when they're talking about autonomous maritime, actually what we're talking about is autonomous navigation, isn't it? And this question uh, brings up this because we have other systems on board or there are other entities that need to be automated to a higher degree if we want to have higher degree of automation at sea. And um, this question, uh, Jake Percival has asked, autonomous navigation seems to be the focus, but how can this be translated over to the engineering side of a vessel's operation? And uh, I'm going to throw this question first to Veegard, actually, because Clayton just got the word, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... Yeah. How I, again? How how do we replace the human being? And then uh, I will uh, support what the other um, people in the panel said that that it's about letting the machines helping the human and and vice versa. So in terms of uh, you know the the bridge solution uh, and and kind of yeah navigational equipment and so on is one thing to control the vessel, but when uh, one um, so the machinery starts to fail and, and how do we uh, ensure that uh, it's fixed uh, in an autonomous way? It's beyond, uh, say, my reach at the moment, but I foresee that there will be, say, redundancy has been one part of it. You know, we can have this uh, go to shore uh, type of, of uh, emergency uh, navigation. So take the vessel back home if anything fails. Uh, we have yeah, redundancy on um, machinery and propulsion uh, depends what type of operation, of course. But uh, you, you can have uh, situations where you will, yeah, mention now drop the anchor and let the vessel stay there and until you will have the human there again to, to help the machine to, to get up and running. Hey, Jan Bernard. Uh in the Yara Birkeland, I think the solution was to go fully electrical. Uh, do you think yeah, that is right. the solution yeah. or do you have some other ideas on this? Yeah, yeah. let me come back to that. Well, um, I think the question is really good because when everything is working, the bridge might actually be the easiest part to automate. Uh, I've been working on a bridge. I've been working also in the engine room. And when you break the shaft in the end room, you have a really big problem and there's no people there. So I think the solution there is, uh, one thing is what you mentioned about Yara Birklan, where you actually can use size. So where you traditionally would have one shaft, you can do what we know from the offshore industry to make systems redundant or diversify the system. Um, like we saw three thrusters on this uh, small uh, container sized USV. And the other thing is actually, and that's the challenging part, is, is the legislation. And that's, if you carefully look at the rules and regulations, they are actually written in a narrative where the, the solution is given. And I think what we need to do is open up for new ways of solving the same purpose. And, and that's maybe not transferable 100% if you're going to do a unmanned engine room for, for months. But, uh, one thing is actually, if you look at operation, uh, do you have rescue vessels that can do the same thing? Instead of fixing things, you rescue the vessel, you tow it to, to shore. 
and make you safe in that way. Okay. So we need to kind of open our minds. All right. Clayton, do you want to add something? I know Vatsla is known for their engines, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, the close cooperation with these things is, is a distinct uh, kind of uh, symbiosis that exists with us. But, y you know, I, and um, apologies if that's how, that, how it came across, right? But, and we d tend to focus the navigation side of things, but the, the engineering uh, officers and the work that's being done there, I, I tend to look back a little bit at the these two trajectories of progress from the engine perspective and then from the bridge perspective. If you look at you know what what an engineer decades and decades ago before sensors and so forth, you know control rooms were right there in the engine room. They were either they were open to the engines where they could smell and feel the heat so forth. And we we created many more layers of technology which which is hopefully simplified and added greater precision to what they're able to do. Um, on the bridge, they're following a similar trajectory of, of, you know, from open bridges to now closed bridges to greater uses of uh, electronic technology and so forth. And I see that the, the engineering side of things is, is able to progress a little bit more um, quickly, let's say, than, than what the, the bridge has done. And so, is there something in the cards that looks similar to the aviation industry where you know, there was always the flight engineer uh, that, that existed within the cockpit? Um, and then those systems then were, were um, oversight was then sent to, uh, to the land base side and then minimal kind of oversight given into the cockpit and troubleshooting and so forth. So maybe that's something in the cards uh, that exists, but they're certainly following a little bit their own trajectories, let's say. But the solution of autonomous and remote control is certainly a story of both of those paths. I think I'm going to wrap up this actually by jumping to another item, but I would wish that you would answer real shortly. <laughs> so uh, we know that IMO has focused a lot on uh, or worked a lot on mass issues. Uh, so um, in Actually, in one month, we're going to have uh, MSC at IMO, and they are going to uh, consider output proposals for how to go forward doing regulation for autonomous maritime um, solutions. And I would like to ask you if you could just wish for one thing from IMO, <laughs> what would you wish uh, very shortly? <laughs> And I'm going to start with Peter this time, if that's okay. For sure. Um, so, I mean, the IMO is a secretariat. So, actually, uh, our inputs through our governments and everything is is how we drive it, because they'll just write what down what they decide in the room. Um, but I, I applaud the fact that uh, you know the IMO has put this on the agenda very quickly in, in our IMO perspectives, and they're moving it forward as as as, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, I think that uh, what we've really got to do in, in terms of the scoping exercise is down to kind of Lisa's question, you know, how do we take this industry forward? Because the IMO is bureaucracy, bureaucracy it's rules and regulations, and technology is moving far quicker than rules and regulations as it stands at this moment in time. So. What they have to do in terms of that scoping exercise is kind of say, who hold on, this is where this is the how we operate today. Are we prepared to give any leniency on that or any changes to that? So that people who are developing these solutions know what that framework is going to be fixed in. So the first thing to do really is to say, no way, you know, the, the coal, coal regs are gonna stay. Because yeah. people, are, people are saying, even in a conventional ship, if I follow the coal regs, I will be involved in lots of accidents. <laughs> I have to steer around certain things and whatever, because not everybody follows them today even. So I think that's what they need to do, is to set that high-level framework so that we all understand the direction we're moving in, and then it can get refined over time as the, the newer technologies come in and the newer, newer ways of operating uh, come in. Thank you, Peter. High level framework. Evolution rather than revolution. <laughs> Excellent. So, 
Uh, how about uh, Clayton? No, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I think. Uh, a strong partnership, right, with the regulators, and, and that is, is essential to success. Uh, revisiting or relooking at the fact that, you know, the pace of change isn't isn't as isn't going to be as uh, slow as it is today, as they say, right. And so, looking at the, a way, how can we more do more quick iterations uh, together through testing and prototyping, and not necessarily looking for the perfect solution that will last. Uh, very much, and I don't mean that at the expense of safety and so forth, but I agree with that that framework that allows these iterations to happen at a at a more frequent pace, in order for us to to gain real life experience, learn from that, apply the learnings, and move forward. Thanks, Begard. Do you want to? Yeah, I, I can. I can. It was IMO. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, yeah uh, increase the speed of, of change. It's uh, vital, I think, for the industry and for the technology. Uh, we we the technology happens now, and as uh, we saw from uh, Gert's uh, presentation earlier, it's it's uh, exponential what will happen in the next coming five to ten years. So it, it's um, yeah this framework that that uh, has been talked of i think that's uh, something uh, uh, we also wish for from uh, from our part thanks and Jon barad you get the last word <laughs> no thank you um yeah i agree with everything that's been said there and i i think we, we need to reflect that the rules we have today is actually decades and decades of experience that is written down what we need now is to actually be able to test our solutions. And there's one thing I thought about when you asked the question, that's the term equivalent, equivalent solution. That's really troublesome for us because you cannot do everything equivalent and it's the same. So we need to be specific of what we mean by that and the process of how do you actually meet that requirement? Yes, it's equivalent. And then you be, need to be able to commercially actually operate and start to learn and apply it in the real world so we can start to learn together and write the new rules that are specific maybe for autonomy. I'm not saying it's gonna get an easy pass, but we need to be more specific on what we need from the technology to make it safe. <laughs>